and um, thank you for the organizers for inviting me to this in, uh, very interesting and exciting exciting event. Uh, this is a new new for me, and of course I'm novice in the mobility no, mobility acts. Uh, and uh, so let me uh, talk about uh, social physics. How many of you have heard that uh, term before, and how long you think it is, uh, or how, how old is the concept? I, I'm keeping this uh, quiz like Anto was giving yesterday. So, any, any idea how long it has been around? 1950s. Sorry? Uh, 1950s. 96. 1960s, uh huh, okay. Any other guesses? Well, actually, I uh, answer with this. Uh, well, first of all, wait, I answered that uh, question. So, overview of my uh, presentation will be about uh, social physics. Uh, what, is, what is social physics? It's a quest of, to understand social phenomena. And then I talk about mobile phone-based uh, social networks, analysis and modeling. Then I go to ecocentric sociality or social behavior, and uh, especially focus on uh, uh, sex differences in intimate uh, relationships. And then uh, go for circadian rhythms in social networks and talk about chronotypes. And there in the, in the gray, there is uh, this uh, act, as, uh, as uh, Tuli mentioned, uh, that uh, gradually going towards the mobility uh, during the pan pandemic time. We have got the data for that, and uh, it is indeed interesting. Okay. To answer the question, when it was coined, this term, it was French philosopher, Auguste Comte, saying uh, right uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the uh, Industrial Revolution that social physics is that science which occupies itself with social phenomena considered in the same light as astronomical, physical, chemical and physiological phenomena. That is to say, as being subject to natural and invariable laws. That is a lot to say, of course. And it can be understood, uh, as I said, it was uh, around the Industrial Revolution. So the worldview of people and scientists were kind of mechanistic. Well, it, uh, had a kind of a renaissance uh, uh, by the book uh, from MIT, Alexander Pentland wrote the book Social Physics. I think it was around 2014 or, or so. And then rapidly a few uh, other articles came. And then I quote one book by Geoffrey West. Uh, he was the former um, head of the Santa Fe Institute. He wrote this book, uh, Scale, in 2017, saying that, um, he was more cautious, saying that the underlying laws of complex social systems are not known yet, but they show regularities, so there must be governing principles. So this is why um, physicists like me is attacking this problem. If you, um, like we physicists used to do, is that we um, think in terms of the structure of the, of the um, system we are interested in, and also the dynamics, dynamical phenomena. If you look at the structure, there's friendship, kinship, then there's uh, groups and communities, and societies, and in terms of the dynamical events, there are social interaction events like uh, phone calls, and then 
dynamic of groups, e.g. group formation, and uh, dynamics in networks, like rumor spreading or something like that. So basically the quest is to understand how does microscopic translate to macroscopic. Well, there are, um, I refer to a few social scientists. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, how, uh, how they have started to look at uh, these uh, social networks. First one is the, is the uh, Mark uh, Granometer. He wrote uh, uh, the article, The Strength of Weak Ties, having a kind of uh, looking at the connectivity structure. And there is the strength of the weak ties hypothesis saying the, st the stronger the tie between two persons, A and B, the larger the proportion of individuals uh, uh, to whom both of them are tied with. It has global consequences and uh, it is indeed uh, telling about the community structure and how the thing is formed. Then there's another one, Robin Dunbar, uh, kind of ecocentric uh, perspective to social networks. And he's saying that it consists of layers of different emotional closeness. And you must have heard about the Dunbar number that uh, this is the kind of click or clan, uh, clan uh, we are actively being able to be in uh, contact. Well, actively and act actively, but how do you define that? It is, uh, uh, it is an evolutionary uh, explanation and uh, based on social brain hypothesis. Okay, um, nowadays uh, we can have many forms of uh, social uh, interaction or so sociality, as it's called. Dunbar made, uh, made this uh, survey study uh, uh, looking at the happiness of people uh, communicating with different means. And then there's a face-to-face -face, uh, Skype at that time. A few years ago, it was the only one phone, mo uh, mobile phone or phone then instant messaging and text and email and social network services. So um, for perceived happiness, I think uh, it is giving the picture that face-to-face uh, uh, -face is, of, of course, the most natural one to us and uh, will uh, uh, and then, then Skype comes near to that. Phones are not as near, but uh, those three, first three, are actually real time. It ha they happen real time. So that differentiates them from the, from the rest. I took a picture of this, um, uh, this Formula One uh, uh, racing uh, drivers. And among them, uh, there are two happy Finns. And uh, so, I mean, Finns were, fin, Finns were uh, kind of surveyed to be the happiest uh, people uh, for consecutive years. So how they saw their happiness? One in the middle is just, uh, it's Kimi Raikkonen just showing his thumb. Well, uh, for the Finns, I mean, the sec I mean, one on the left from him is uh, Walter Bottas. He goes really, as the Finn goes overboard, he even raises his hands. And then uh, Sebastian Vettel on the, on the right seems to smile. Okay. So, uh, what is the kind of physics approach? Uh, the approach is that um, we have data, it is collected uh, from uh, digital me uh, by digital means, and uh, we have these data, big databases. Then we have also um, high-performance computing for data analytics. 
network and complex system science and social science, of course. I mean, joining those uh, together could be considered as social physics. Or it, it is called also computational social science or social informatics, data driven social science, and so on. But the question is that uh, you are interested in the structure, you are interested, interested in the function, and also how the system responds if there are some external, external um, uh, forces acting on it. And the methodology is the analy uh, analysis. Having learned through analysis something of the structure, you want to, uh, or physicists want to at least to start building up models. And if you, you do the modeling, you understand the uh, mecha mechanism, perhaps the mechanisms, and if, if uh, they are becoming uh, more accurate, then you might be starting thinking that this is, uh, you try to do simulations or even up to forecasting. So this is the kind of empirical or exploratory approach. There are a number of methodologies we can, we can, we can use, but before that, uh, uh, social sciences are usually considered to be hypothesis-based uh, research. And the physics and the natural sciences, you are mostly doing explorative things. But there's no, no quarrel in this, but because you can combine these approaches and, uh, 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 and learn from the other and then uh, go on from uh, that. You can have uh, the approach can be kind of what I call physical approach, uh, especially including the modeling part, but then you can also have a statistical, statistical approach like, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, deep learning stuff, and a number of other things there. Okay, let me, um, I started to do this kind of thing um, more than 15 years ago. We got hold of uh, this uh, mobile phone data set from a European country. It stretches over three months at that time, and uh, um, it, call, uh, it had this call detailed uh, record, uh, who is calling uh, to whom. Uh, it, uh, of course, the data set was anonymized, and, uh, and, and so on. So we were thinking how to uh, build up a social network from that. So the key element is that uh, if I have a social contact with somebody, like Tulia, for example, then I, I may make her a call, but in order to that to be a kind of social interaction, Tulia would have to call me back. So that's the, uh, and the, the strength of this uh, social link is how many calls, in this case, how many calls or how many minutes or seconds you have been spending over the phone within a certain period of time. So that is how it is, uh, the network is built. And the, and the result is, uh, oh, well, okay, we we'll have to go here. The result is like that. This is just a sample. And if you um, zoom in, you can see structure there. There are communities like that, which are uh, uh, tightly connected to each other. But then uh, these co uh, communities are connected with weak ties to others. Okay. Then we uh, wanted to understand uh, is there is the uh, Granovetter's weak ties hypothesis uh, uh, valid in this large data set? And indeed, uh, we uh, looked at the overlap of, of two individuals. Here, for example, um, on, the, um, on, the, on the left, there are two individuals over here, but they don't share any other 
friendships or connections. Here are some, and here are full connectivity. So, as, uh, as the uh, Granovetter's hypothesis uh, say, is that uh, uh, neighborhood overlap, when neighborhood overlap increases, the connectivity or the uh, tie strength between these, these two individuals is, is uh, getting uh, stronger. Also, um, we did some um, other experiments um, in the lower, lower part over here. We started to take a cut cut these links uh, in different orders. Then there was, first of all, in descending order, going from the strongest link towards the weakest link. And when there was only 20% only of these links remaining, then still the kind of backbone of that structure was there. But then if you did it the other way around, if you started to con I mean, cut the weaker bonds first and going towards the stronger bonds. Then uh, with the same amount of bonds remaining, or uh, links remaining, then the uh, connectiv connectivity in that network had disappeared. So the weak ties are different from the, the role of weak ties is different from the stronger ties. Okay, then the modeling thing. We like to do a lot of modeling, and there was a study made by Kosnets and Watts, empirical analysis of, uh, of an evolving uh, social network, and they found out that the so social tie formation, there are two main mechanisms. Uh, what is called cycle closer, forming ties with one's network neighbors, and then the other one is focal closer, forming ties um, if people are sharing hobbies or something, something of that sort. So we um, had these two mechanisms, what we call the local attachment, and then the global attachment. And then in, the, in addition that in the social network, always it happens that uh, that nodes or links disappear. We had this kind of, in, in the model, this link reinforcement, which uh, corresponds to Grana uh, uh, Western's weak ties hypothesis like thing. I mean, the, um, the, um, basically the cyclic closure mechanism. And when we are varying that, then if there is no reinforcement, the, the network looks like a snowball. But if you increase that, then you start seeing, seeing these, um, uh, these um, uh, so communities forming. So it is very much like, uh, uh, at least uh, here, looks like a real network. And then we uh, did the same tricks as we did for the for the analytic parts. And indeed, what we found, the uh, weak ties hypothesis behavior in this network. So there uh, on the picture, uh, I mean, the overlap versus tie strength. And also we found that the that, uh, role of weak and weak ties are different from the strong ties. Okay. Now let's move on to the um, egocentric perspective. This is the Granovetter's uh, perspective, uh, having um, kind of layers of different emotional closeness. But we have, have, have more data, uh, we got more data, so we could uh, 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 ask uh, deeper, deeper questions. And the question we wanted to ask was, are there gender and age-specific properties or differences in one's social relation. We, have, we had expanded this um, data set. So we had uh, um, 
data set um, of all the calls within one operator uh, for more than three years. It consisted of 10 million service subscribers, 10 billion calls, 1 billion text messages. But in addition, we got the gender of the subscriber, age of the subscriber, postcode code of the subscriber where the phone bill is sent, and also the most used tower position. But I have to emphasize that this is a prehistoric data, prehistoric in the sense that at that time, people were not using at least that much uh, smartphones. The smartphones came later, and also the social network services uh, started to boom a bit later. Perhaps in the, in the tail end of that uh, uh, data set. Okay, we had this data. We uh, asked, um, we wanted to know the degree of friendship. So we uh, took an, an ego and one person knew its uh, gender, either male or female, and looked at the frequency of contacts between an ego and alter, some other person. So uh, what, uh, and, uh, and um, average the gender of the best friend in terms of these calls, frequency of calls, and what we found out is that, uh, first of all, the best friend for a, for a male seems to be a female. Most frequent calls go to female, as you can uh, see here, this, is the, uh, this goes to the negative side as defined over here, then, then uh, the best friend is female. And for the female ego, the best friend is male. And the curve seems to be somewhat different. It starts uh, a bit earlier and stays longer at a higher higher volume, so to speak. We have been uh, calling this uh, slow uh, decay uh, clock is ticking. Okay, the second best friend the, uh, is of the same sex. Okay. Then we look at the age distribution. Of course, if you take the male uh, of uh, 25 and uh, female of 25, they concentrate on the same age. Okay, well, have to speed up. So, um, um, and then um, that, that's for uh, 25 years old, old and then, um, then for the 50 years. There you can start seeing that uh, that when people get uh, older, their attention shifts from the spouse to, to, to the children, basically. Women are more active in maintaining family relationships, and the mother-daughter link is particularly strong. You can, you can see it uh, uh, here. Oh, well, <laughs> okay, here. Yeah, okay. Then if you go even, uh, even older, then uh, what happens uh, is that if you look at this one, uh, the 60-year-old uh, female uh, has uh, moved uh, much more of the attention to the, to the children, and, uh, and the spouse seems to uh, play the third fiddle, not the first. I mean, the daughter is the first fiddler, fiddler and then the Son is, is the second fiddler, and then the poor man is the, is the uh, only the third. Okay. Uh, this is uh, actually, uh, let me go, go uh, well, uh, I can't go back. Okay, well, let me, let me move, move on. I mean, there was this uh, effect of turning attention to the, 
to the daughter is called a grandmothering effect. Okay, a few years ago, there was uh, this, um, I mean, five years ago, Nobel Prize was, um, uh, Nobel Prize in medicine was given uh, uh, to, uh, to three people uh, finding out uh, the molecular mechanism of, 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 uh, of circadian rhythm. It's an interesting thing. It was uh, the biological clock, it is called the other way. It was found in, in a plant, a mimosa plant, uh, that what it happens is that when it is uh, sunlight, when it's uh, a day, sunlight is there, it is open its leaves. When it's night, it cramps its leaves. But then this uh, uh, astronomer, French astronomer, uh, made a test. And putting, uh, putting the plant in total darkness, and then in the... Um, when it was supposed to be day, the mimosa plant opened its leaves. And when it uh, was a night, supposed to be night, it cramped it again. Okay. So, I mean, we were inspired uh, uh, to find out uh, uh, what can we find out from these uh, mobile phone networks about this circadian rhythm. So our question was that, uh, one more question, to what extent is daily behavioral behavior of people in urban envi environment still influenced by seasonal changes in the daylight? And the other one, given the social time where urban people live in, do the environmental factors like the sunrise, sunset, length of the daylight, and the ambient temperature influence the timing? the daily activities are performed, and do, so, uh, do the socially uh, driven activities of people living in different uh, places, um, uh, uh, but inside the same time zone, onset and terminate their activities at the same time. Okay, uh, we, so we enhanced the data set uh, with, uh, with uh, seasonal records. They were open, open data, geophysical records, and also country statistics. And what we found out, uh, there is this um, daily uh, mobile phone activity, which is a kind of human daily rhythm. It is actually semi uh, semi-circadian or circasemidian, they call it, they have two peaks of activities and in the middle there is a low activity um, time. Okay, so we looked at uh, uh, the low activity time first low, uh, and then found out that during the winter people actually sleep one hour longer or are less active, we, call, we interpret it as sleep, but okay, sleep uh, one hour uh, longer than uh, during the summer. And here is the um, graph showing uh, in different weekdays how it is. Strongest the effect is on Sundays. Okay, the other one, Look at the uh, low activity period during the daytime, which in some countries are called a siesta time. And what, what we found out, that when the temperature went over 25, that siesta time tended to become longer. Well, it's understandable, it's unbearable, like, like in this heat, for me at least, uh, it's rather unbearable. So, okay, uh, then if you count these kind of resting times, you consider this uh, daily low activity as a resting time as well, in, in, in addition to the, to the night time, then lo and behold, what happens is that you have a flat curve, rather flat curve. The other thing is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, looking at uh, these uh, urban places in the 
westernmost and easternmost towns or cities in that country. They are differentiated with uh, 10.7 longitudinal degrees. 15 degrees is one time zone. So what we, uh, what we found out actually is that, okay, 10.7, it would be something like uh, uh, 43 minutes. So we, we found out actually that in the westernmost city of that country, people start, I mean, start their day something like uh, 43 minutes later. So people are around the year synchronized to the east-west uh, progression of the sun. Even though, uh, in the, okay, one minute, yes. So the last uh, uh, thing we were looking at is chronotypes. And uh, we did this factor analysis. Chronotype um, is a person, I mean, uh, uh, people are divided to, um, to I mean, basically two different chronotypes or a kind of variation between them. Those are, who are early, uh, early birds are called the larks, and those who are uh, uh, not so early birds, I mean, late uh, evening dwellers, uh, they are called owls. And then in the middle, they, uh, people are called uh, uh, third, third bird, or something like that. And, uh, and uh, uh, so there's something like uh, 15 to 20 percent of, 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 of larks and 15 to 20 percent of, uh, of, of, uh, of owls, and then the rest is the third bird. Okay, so what we did, uh, we analyzed uh, things and uh, we looked at um, what is their gender and uh, age differences uh, between the thing. First of all, the age, if you look at the age, uh, younger people are more owlish. They, they uh, stay on later, tend to be more owlish than and older people are more larkish. And middle-aged women are more owlish than men, for some reason. And the owlish women sleep less on the weekdays than the owlish men. So, the concluding thing, there are many other things we have been doing in terms of social social physics, uh, uh, so the quest, I mean, to sort of summarize the quest is to understand the underlying uh, principle of human social behavior. So social physics give us an exploratory insight into the structure, function, and response, and the, and the methodologies are those um, analysis uh, modeling and simulation which can lead even to prediction. Are we there yet? Well, may, we may be far away, but uh, I, I picked up uh, this um, Isaac Asimov's uh, um, book series, Foundation, it's called, it's a trilogy. And then uh, 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 Asimov is known to have been making kind of forecasts, and a number of forecasts uh, are, are actually met. So, so, to, so to speak. And this is uh, one of the forecasts he's uh, calling psychohistory. There was a fellow, Hardy, 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 Harry Seldon, a mathematician and psychologist, developed a psychohistory, a new field of science and psychology that equates all possibilities in large societies to mathematics, allowing for the prediction of, the f of future events. Well, that's uh, his forecast made some, uh, 
I think it was uh, the book series came out 51 to 53, so 70 years ago. Well, I leave it uh, for the younger, younger crowd here uh, to find out whether that is, is to be realized. But um, my main point here is that, uh, is that modeling is also a tool which is uh, very versatile. What I, what I want to do is kind of data-driven modeling, that you, you do it in this kind of in sequence. And when you do these things, always take a social scientist with you, because it's, it's combining the, uh, combining the uh, best of both, so to speak. Exploratory with, with the hypothesis based. Uh, that is the way I have been uh, working in the past 20 years in this. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kimmo, for a fascinating, fascinating talk. Uh, maybe we have time for, for one or two questions before going to the panel. Henrik Kitenkanen. There is a mic, yes, it's coming. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kimmo, for uh, inspiring talk. Um, I'm Henrik Kitenkanen from Aalto University. Um, I'm, I was thinking um, in terms of like the social physics and so on, so the idea is, uh, I guess, quite typically to find these kind of underlying laws like scaling law and visitation laws and, and, and these kind of things. And I was just wondering, like, um, what is your thought of the, the idea? In the previous session, there was the question about this kind of a typical uh, average person, so to say. Uh, and, and quite often, for example, in uh, accessibility-related studies that I'm personally doing, so we're actually quite interested in not necessarily only on the average person, but to specific population groups, for example. So, so how do you see, like, uh, are there ways with these kind of um, physical laws or, or these kind of approaches that you are using to actually um, get uh, or try to understand this kind of specific groups and, and how, how would that work? Uh, well, I, I think it is, it is possible. Uh, uh, this average person is, uh, is a kind of fascinating. Also in physics, what you do is, uh, it's called mean field theory. You apply mean field approach. Uh, so that's a kind of average, uh, average uh, uh, averaging out uh, sort of uh, uh, fluctuations and looking at what is, what is the sort of core. And then from that, you start doing a different kind of analysis. You go to the, if the um, average is, the, um, for example, in the average of Gaussian distribution, then, then, then uh, you start looking at the tails as well. And, uh, and, um, and here, uh, in, in my earlier part of the talk, uh, uh, you can you can focus on these, for example, these communities. What happened there, and uh, uh, and this data what we have, since it is kind of individually based data, we can focus on different kinds of persons. Like we could um, uh, uh, look at the larks and the uh, owls and, uh, and 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 so on. So this gives us a kind of full scale of uh, looking at the different things. We can look at the, at the population level, but then we, we can start focusing towards the individual level as well and differentiate between them. So that's, I think, one of the, uh, one of the beauties that if you, if you can get, although it is, it is rather regulated uh, that uh, um, in, in Europe, there's a CDPR uh, uh, that you have to uh, follow, and in Finland, there is uh, even even stronger law, the secondary use law, and uh, things of that sort. So, so that uh, uh, gives some difficulties. But I mean, if one can go to that, then uh, and these uh, I mean, larger data sets like the UNESCO things. I mean, if uh, they could uh, as a kind of 
global organizations uh, even start providing gender, age, and things, things of that sort. Thank you. Okay, maybe we do so that we now end with that and come back to Kimmo's presentation still a bit in the panel discussion and now give a big hand for the presentation first. Okay.